What is up, guys? Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast. Uh, it's me here, Gary, this week with Mr. Lee Bell, who we're getting on the podca- podcast to discuss um, a number of topics that we've probably touched on on the, on the podcast before, but never really kind of delved deeper into or got an expert to really discuss. So we're going to be discussing things related to recovery, uh, overreaching, overtraining. You've probably heard some of those terms and Lee really knows the research quite well. Um, so, so he'll be able to, to give us some solid insight there and hopefully some practical takeaways for, for trainers and trainees as well. But before we get there, Lee, what's the story with you? What do you do yourself uh, t- tell the people a bit about your, your background and, and where you're at currently. Yeah, sure. Uh, cheers for the invite, guys. Um, so I'm currently a lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, based off your introduction there, Mr. Lee Bell, I haven't got my PhD yet. <laughs> so I'm just in there. Yeah, cheers for that, mate. <laughs> I'm just in the process of uh, my PhD now, which is in uh, overreaching and overtraining, specifically within strength sports. Um, but in order to get a good overall understanding there are elements of endurance and team sports and recreational based athletes and things like that as well and just to give it kind of like a cast and eye uh, the net wide approach Uh, away from Sheffield Hallam I am co-director of TRA performance education with a friend of mine Dr Paul Rimmer who's based in Leeds Um, I think that pretty much it I do little bits of consultancy with athletes but in all honesty with the time I have these days I kind of goes a little bit by the wayside so there's little bits I do in the periphery um, but mostly my my life at the moment is as an academic and researcher. Nice and what about what about coaching before that did you did you do any coaching yourself as a practitioner prior to to the acad- academic side? Yeah I guess I heard this term for the first time a while back pracademic so a practitioner <laughs> that then becomes an academic I quite like that so I think that kind of sums up my journey. Um, I I actually did a degree in sport and exercise science at the university that I teach at now. And after completing that undergrad, I went straight out into the field, working as a personal trainer, working in strength and conditioning, you know, as you do the qualifications, you start getting the experience, you go out there, you try, you apply. Um, Ended up doing little bits in clinical practice randomly uh, with the NHS, just kind of prescribing exercise for different clinical populations. Um, working in sports like tennis and rugby and football, long distance running. And then as time went on, it's kind of got a little bit more of a passion around the bodybuilding and strength sport fields. Um, Decided off the back of that to go and do a master's degree, which if I'm being honest, was mostly just out of interest rather than any career aspirations or anything like that. But that master's degree led to, um, I think, just the planting of a seed that the academic saying was something that I really enjoyed. I love listening to lectures talk about deep physiology and biomechanics and neuromuscular system based stuff. So I decided that's what I wanted to do. So kind of got into teaching little bits of associate lecturing, teaching fitness qualifications, um, managed to get a publication from that master's degree uh, dissertation that I submitted and, you know, various steps along the way but ended up as an academic so you know been in practice for probably the best part of 15 years which I think helps for the modules that I'm involved in at Sheffield Hallam which are largely more practice based so you know developing professional skills um, looking at issues contemporary issues in sport and exercise science it's the kind of things that you don't you don't learn from a textbook and you don't learn from a physiology lecture you learn from practitioners and experience and, you know, what do you do if an athlete breaks down and starts crying in the gym? You, you don't find that in Mercado catch and catch. It's that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think the, um, the kind of pracademic thing, um, I think that, that suits me as a label. Nice. And, and you've, so you've moved on to focusing more on strength sports in your PhD now, but has that, has that always been a primary interest for, for, for you? Or is that influenced by your own personal training history, like in terms of what you've done yourself or, or where did that come out of? Yeah, it was, I, th- I think, so the, the, the master's degree thesis was part of a collaboration study. So it was, there was a PhD student who was looking at, um, the effects of I think they were looking at female athlete triad or reds model or they were doing something with female athletes relative to endurance training and they had some males come in as might have been controls or something I can't remember the intricacies of the study now but essentially I just went in there collected some data and then said okay well I just want to look at some markers of overreaching and overtraining in these endurance athletes 
um, to create some some data based around that. When I was looking at kind of formulating the search strategy, and as, as you'll know from your inclusion and exclusion criteria, it was kind of like, right, you do your broad search terms, we'll look for overtraining and endurance training, and you just flooded with hundreds and hundreds of these different studies. And I was like, all right, cool, this is a lot to get through, but that's the purpose of why we're here. And I think it was something like 200 plus studies that came up with those key words. But what I, what I was kind of looking at in the same sense was that there was very little coming back with overtraining and then strength sports or resistance training or weightlifting or powerlifting. And that got me thinking that if I go down the overtraining and endurance line, what am I actually adding to this already existing wealth of information? Whereas if I kind of steer my interest more towards the strength sports, then there's potential there to create a nice little niche area. So that would be the kind of cynical perspective. I'd always been interested in the kind of bodybuilding and strength sports anyway, from, from just my own training background. So it kind of made sense. Um, and, and I think that's worked in my favor. I mean, obviously it's led to, you know, doing interviews like this where I, I seem to be, I seem to have fallen on an area that is under research. There isn't a lot out there. The unfortunate reality is that when people talk about overtraining, they'll give guidance based around, well, as a strength athlete or, you know, someone that lifts weights, this is what you should do. And these are the markers that you need to be aware of. But all of that just comes from the endurance literature. And actually, when you look at the difference, the markers are not always the same. In fact, mostly they're quite different. So, you know, you, I think I said this in every single podcast I've been on, like, I, I love looking at the hashtag of overtraining on Instagram because it gives us an idea what the end user perceives that word to mean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's always um, an infographic, top five, five things to look out for in overtraining. And it'd be things like changes in rest and heart rate. Yeah, we might see some autonomic disturbance in endurance literature and endurance athletes, but not necessarily in strength athletes. So, you know, I think for me, it's, it's very early stages. And like I said, there's not a lot of information out there, but already seeing some really cool stuff about how we might be able to create some kind of test battery for strength athletes, recreational uh, weightlifters that's not already out there. Nice. And I, I do think it's a really interesting area because like I know from, from kind of my own experience, like in, in the field of personal training, let's say, and listening to what other trainers say and other S and C coaches say, you often hear things being thrown around, like, you know, there's no such thing as overtraining just under eating or something like that. Or another one that would probably come from more evidence-based people would be something along the lines of, or oh, in overtraining is something you need to worry about in endurance sports, but it's not something you need to worry about in, in, in resistance training. So I suppose that brings me to the question of, to you of, 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 is this relevant to, to resistance training? Can you reach the point of overtraining? And if not, where does the book stop from what we have in the evidence at the moment with just weight training and strength sports, et cetera? Uh, it's a potentially long answer that one. So go for it, man. I want, I want right. to ask a broad question. <laughs> right. Okay. Let you go. Wind on. me up. I'm off now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing that would be a value would be to look at what those words actually mean. Yes. Um, so I think overtraining itself can be used as a, a verb. It can be used as a doing word. I am overtraining, which just simply means you're training harder than what your recovery capacity is. So when someone says I am overtraining, it just means that they're training hard relative to their capacity, right? Um, overtraining syndrome is something that's different. It's syndromatic, it's multifactorial, it's a medical disorder. And that's characterized specifically. So if you were to look at position statements around what the definition of overtraining syndrome is, it's a significant decrease in performance. So whatever that performance metric might be relative to your sport, which takes several weeks or months or longer to recover from. So if, again, if you go back to that, oh, I am overtraining, I'm training a little bit too hard. If you recover within a few days, a couple of weeks, you did not suffer from overtraining syndrome you were just training a little bit harder than what you could recover to. So that's the difference. And again, you know, if you look at something like Instagram and you look at how the, the end user perceives that word, then I can see why the two would be mixed up. I mean, it's got the word training in it and the word over in it, you're training over your recovery capacity. So that, that kind of leads us on then to, I guess, some very interesting speculative papers around, well, experts have looked at that and they've gone, no one understands what this syndrome is. Maybe we should redefine it. So I know that in, I think it was the year 2000, Richard Budget tried to redefine the overtraining syndrome as the unexplained underperformance syndrome. And that kind of makes sense. But outside of the UK, it never really caught on. Not many people use that as, a, as actual replacement for the overtraining syndrome. 
Um, I think it was last year in Brazil, a researcher came up with the paradoxical deconditioning syndrome, which is actually, if you break each word down, it, it's actually a great synonym term, paradoxical deconditioning. So you're training really, really hard, but you're actually performing worse and worse and worse. And syndrome, again, multifactorial etiology of the disorder. Um, but it's a bit of a mouthful. And yeah. it's not a great hashtag on Instagram, you know, so it's never really going to catch on. So the, the, the terminology is really, really important. And then the timescales are important as well. So, okay, well, what if you had a significant reduction in performance, but it only took a couple of weeks or a month to recover from? That's not overtraining syndrome. So what is it? It's not acute fatigue, because we know that the definition of acute fatigue is you recover within a few days or so. So then you open up this terminology around overreaching. So overreaching can be then split into two categories, functional overreaching and non-functional. So functional means, yes, you suffered from a decrease in performance, but after a taper, a deload, a recovery, whatever, you come out the other side and your performance has improved. So I think, you know, if you use the old Russian terminology, super compensation, but essentially you got better. So that's functional overreaching because, yes, you, you reached a little bit too far in your training, but it had a functional outcome. You did improve, you got better. Non-functional overreaching is you train hard, performance went down, you implement a taper, you implement a deload, but by the time you recover, there's no significant improvement, you just return to baseline. So it's non-functional because there's no actual functional benefit. Part of my research is trying to define where that functional and non-functional line occurs. And it appears to be extremely difficult because there's so much inter and intra-individual variance. Um, we know that athletes will get worse or, or the people will get worse in general during a block of training, but we'll only know whether it had a functional outcome after the deload. So that then comes down to, well, there has to be a general understanding and discussion with that athlete about how they're feeling and um, motivation, mood and things like that in combination with some metrics to try and build up a portfolio of that athlete. The first time we try and overreach, it may, might work well, it might not work well, but then we learn from that, we reapply and, and we keep going at it until um, until we get it back on, if at all we ever do. So I think, you know, if you look at all those words I've just used there and you kind of string them along a spectrum or a continuum, we've got acute fatigue right at one end, you train hard for a session, you're a bit beat up for a couple of days, but then you recover. You've then got a functional overreaching, non-functional overreaching, and then right at the end, you've got overtraining syndrome with this blanket umbrella term of overtraining, which just means you're training a little bit harder than recovery. So I hope that makes sense. There's kind of a lot, yeah, a lot no, of the that, that was right. weather terms. Because right? you, co you covered a lot, of the, a lot of the different things that I wanted to bring up, especially you know the difference between functional overreaching and non-functional overreaching. And just that, that simple acute fatigue component that you brought up, because obviously like that's an important, a very basic thing, but it's a really important thing for, for us to get as trainers or S&C coaches or whatever, that an, a, a decrement in performance following a session is normal initially. You know, you wouldn't expect to do, I don't know, five sets at your one rep max and come back and do it again three hours later. Like it wouldn't be expected that you'd be able to do that. There's going to be some level of fatigue that comes from that. And I think another important thing that you touched on there was the fact that if you are trying to run some sort of overreaching phase, if that's part of the training plan, that being more fatigued, not feeling great and performance not increasing acutely is a normal part of that process. Because I find that that's something that, that I have to uh, reinforce with some clients who are more strength focused, let's say that, you know, we might be week five, week six in a training block and they might be saying, oh, you know, the weights that I lifted last week are actually feeling just as heavy or maybe even heavier this week. I'm feeling tired going into the session and whatever. And, and if you don't understand the fact that, hey, look, we've actually got a light week of training coming next week. And then as we move into the next block, we've actually, we're actually going to move to lower reps and, and whatever else. If you don't understand that that's coming, I think that can be daunting for people. And what I have seen in some cases is that if someone maybe doesn't plan out their training at all and they're just kind of going in and maxing out each week, once it gets to that week where there's no longer an improvement, they're like, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to change my approach. Whereas there's potentially benefit in actually pushing on for that week when you don't feel so great at times. So I, but that's a big mouthful for me. But my question for you would be, 
um, are there ways that someone can tell if they're pushing maybe too far into the non-functional versus the functional stage? Or do we just not really know that at the practical level yet? I think what's worth covering first is that Go ahead. in a periodized plan, so if we, if we talk specifically about athletes at the moment, then we'll kind of come back to more recreational yep. athletes afterwards. So performance-based athletes, there is a periodized plan where there are potentially opportunities to say, okay, rather than taking just a general progressive overload approach where we'll train and we get a little bit worse, but then we recover, we improve slightly. We train again, we recover, we recover, we improve slightly. So it's just kind of like hit, recover, hit, recover, hit, recover. We'll just have a, a just a very small period of time, maybe like a, a one or two week microcycle where we'll just train and train and train and train and train, sometimes multiple times a day. And the idea is that we're not, trying to create fatigue we're trying to create the adaptation we're trying to create the stimulus at least to the adaptation at least to the performance improvement and we just accept that along the way we will just build up fatigue that's just part of the process of overloading training we have a chat with the athlete we tell them look for the next couple of weeks you're going to be training so hard that you will feel beat up you will feel sore you probably won't want to come to the gym you won't like me as the coach but you can see that 14 days time we're just going to really start to deload. We'll reduce the volume down and you will see that improvement in performance. And I said, we'll see that improvement in performance. We would hope, we would anticipate that that would be the case. And um, that's quite common in sports like powerlifting and weightlifting for some coaches. Some coaches say, well, I prefer not to do a planned or purposeful overreach because there is this risk of going, going a little bit too far and the recovery takes a little bit too long. And by the time we have recovered, some of those adaptive processes start to detrain a little bit. So it can have negative impact. Um, so that would be like a planned, a purposeful overreach. Now, more in recreational trainers that have, um, you know, like long work hours, family commitments, and social commitments and things like that is you can still overreach, but you don't do it on purpose. So it may well be that you're just like, oh, you know, I'm going to finish early work. I'll go and hit the gym for a couple of hours. Um, that's an extra session that's gone in there that wasn't necessarily planned. We know that non-training stress can accelerate the symptoms of non-functional overreaching. So, you know, for some people that are feeling a little bit beat up and a little bit stressed from work, it's like, no, I'm still going to go to the gym. You know, I've still got this programmed in. I'm going to go and you have a pretty shit session, but you're like, no, I'm still going to go. I'm going to go tomorrow, go tomorrow. All while feeling really stressed. All of a sudden, you know, you don't sleep as well, which adds additional non-training stress on it just accelerates, just puts, you know, the, the, the kind of foot on the gas pedal into non-functional overreaching. So I think to answer the question, that would be one of the things to look at. We'll be trying to balance the training stress with the non-training stress. Um, in, in terms of, can, are there any tests and metrics available? Not really, because, again, it's all, we know it's an inevitable part of the process that there will be fatigue, but when does that fatigue become too much fatigue? That's what we're trying to measure. And we can't really do that because if we take a prophylactic approach, then we would never create so much of a stimulus to create that much fatigue. We'd never actually be overreaching. That would be just a typical progressive overload approach. Uh, there are, within the kind of resistance training and strength sports data, there are some tests that might indicate an increased risk of non-functional overreaching. But again, how do we know that it's not functional until we apply the deload at the end? So, so, you know, some metrics that seem to be quite sensitive are uh, bar velocity. So we see that that under, you know, under fatigue seems to slow down a little bit. And um, interestingly, maximal strength doesn't really seem to change that much. It's not a very sensitive metric until right at the very end. So I think if you're relying on your 1RMs to indicate whether you're non-functionally overreach, you might be quite, you know, you might be quite disappointed and surprised by that. Um, what else have we got? There are a number of biochemical assays and hormones that you could measure. But again, what you've got to think is, as a recreational trainer, have you got access to that kind of stuff? No, of course not. Probably not. There may be some autonomic disturbances. So, you know, I'm sure at some point we'll talk about things like heart rate variability. But me and you might do the exact same training session, same block of training. My heart rate variability might change. It might be a negative impact, but yours might not. You know, so there is this inter-individual variance that we can't account for. Um, so a lot of it just comes down to, I think, a retrospective analysis is sitting down and going, right, what happened in that last block of training? What happened and how do we fix it next time? Or, wow, that went well. Let's see if we can repeat that again further down the line. Um, to kind of wrap up the answer as well is 
just going back to this with the plan and purposeful overreaching is there are some really cool papers, um, one in endurance training and one in strength training, where it's looked at actually is, is an overreach to facilitate this supercompensatory effect? Is it actually necessary? And there's no clear answer one way or the other, but probably not. There is nothing wrong with using a typical progressive approach or a non-periodized approach. Some athletes respond really, really well to this short-term intensified period of training and others don't. So again, I think it comes down to, you can follow all the metrics in the world, but sometimes it just comes down to that individual. So from a coaching perspective, from a personal training perspective, or however you want to look at it, it's just as important to ask questions of the athlete, not just go, oh, this metric says this, therefore we should change your, your training accordingly. It's using those metrics, but saying, how are you feeling today? You know, are you stressed? How's work? How's life? How's your diet? How's your sleep? And then using that to kind of use this evidence-based approach where we combine what the data says with what the athlete says um, to try and create the best plan going forwards. I think, I think something you said there that, that was interesting was, was bringing up the fact that you can't necessarily be prophylactic with this, that it's the, the, the fact that if you were to, to try and differentiate between functional and non-functional overreaching, you have to take into consideration the fact that there is a deload period that comes after and for example, if we were to say that me and you, Lee, were both otherwise com- were, were completely different, complete le- same level of strength, same genetics, etc., and we both run the same training program, we're both having the same symptoms as we come up towards the end of the training block. You know, I'm saying, oh, you know, my shoulder's not fantastic, and I'm feeling tired going into the gym. My motivation's a bit low, and then we both run a 10 day deload. Let's say on my 10 day deload, I decide. I'm going to go out drinking t- three times. I'm actually under eating because when I'm not in the gym, I don't bother adhering to my nutrition. I'm not sleeping well, etc. Whereas you, you're like, I'm, you're militant with this shit. You're like, nutrition is on point, no drinking, recovering, etc. Even though the two training blocks were the exact same and even the stimulus up to the point of the deload was the exact same, we might actually say that yours was a functional overreach, whereas mine was a non-functional overreach, despite being the same training program. So, you know, what comes after is, is, is I guess, determining the adaptation, which is, which is important because it, it shows that relationship there between the training stimulus and the subsequent adaptation that comes from that. That's a great point. Yeah, what we do after the overreach is just as important as the overreach itself. I think um, you hit on a really interesting point there about, you know, in terms of this kind of like, preventative prophylactic approach. I think it was Fern Gambetta maybe that said that in a way we're creating undertrained athletes because everyone's scared now of fatigue. And sometimes you just have to accept that, look, if I want this stimulus and I want this adaptation, fatigue's coming along on the journey. It's an inevitable part of the process. You just kind of have to suck it up. And that is the case for a lot of programming. Um, otherwise what you do is you, you get caught up in the hysteria and it's, you know, I'm a little bit sore, right? I need to auto-regulate and deload. And sometimes you just know, just keep training. Um, and it's just about learning from your body. And just, again, it's just that retrospective learning process. Yeah. And, and that, that is something that I think is, is actually pervasive in, in the fitness industry is like, while people have become more aware of, let's say the importance of recovery in facilitating adaptation, sometimes you can take that too far to the point where you're so focused on recovery that you're not actually allowing for any of the fatigue that is necessary for productive training, you know, and, and you see this manifest in, for example, as you mentioned, the use of things like heart rate variability. And I've seen, you know, people who will say, HRV is down, down 10 today. So I'm not going to train. And it's like, okay, you know, fair enough. But like, how were you actually feeling? You know, did, were you up late last night? Did you have a drink that could have depressed your HRV a little bit? There's so many things that go into like determining one's autonomic state at any moment in time. And if you allow that to, you know, determine the fact that you do or don't train, I think like there's potential for maladaptation in some cases, because you could have had, you could have had a, a previous approach where, you didn't maybe pay so much attention to specific metrics and always checking in with yourself and you were training five days a week. And now you look at your average training days for the next year and you're only training three days a week because you, some days you didn't feel like it. I think you could be holding yourself back in some cases then, you know? So, so there's probably a, a sweet spot there in terms of 
paying attention to the fact that yeah, recovery is important, but you don't yeah. want to to baby yourself so much that you don't allow for for any feelings of fatigue either. I guess. Yeah, I mean, bottom line is from my perspective, I'm a sport and exercise scientist. I'm data driven. I like to look at numbers and I like to make assumptions off those numbers. But I and and just actually at the back end now of collecting data from some high performance coaches in various strength sports. So these are, these are coaches that have had Olympic level athletes and just sitting with them and interviewing them and getting an idea of their perceptions around data and how they use different tools and metrics. And I think that some of the, some of the results are quite surprising in that some of them yet they use metrics like, you know, um, force plates and jump performance or weightlifting specific performance, one RMs, heart rate variability and all different things like that. But they don't just use those in isolation. They don't just go, like you just said then, heart rate variability, we've got a standard deviation change. Therefore, this is what's happening with your training. They'll use that to open a dialogue between them and the athlete and say, okay, tell me a little bit about how you're feeling. Now, really interestingly, some of them just kind of go, you know what? I don't need that metric because I'm going to ask my athlete how they feel anyway. So when they walk through the door, I know them that well by their body language and the smile on their face, what the type of training will be. How are you today? Yeah, great coach. All right, cool. Get under the bar, get lifting. How are you today, coach? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty shit and beat up. Well, you always say that, get under the bar and lift. <laughs> or I'm feeling pretty beat up. Mm, you're usually the first one under the bar. We need to have a discussion. We need to see what's happening. So that's really, really important. And I think that, you know, we there are a variety of commercially available products now that can help to tell us whether we are potentially in an overreach state, whether we can apply more training load. And some of those tools are really, really good. Some of them have really large error margins and we just need to be careful of that. And, you know, I think that I think David Nolan did some research, didn't he quite, um, quite recently around if you notice that one of a singular metric said your athlete fatigue was fatigued, would you deload them? And oh, the majority yeah. of coaches said, yeah. And it was like, would, would you not ask the, the athlete how they would feel? Surely that would be an important part of the journey. And that to me is quite worrying that we are relying on this commercially available stuff that, you know, doesn't tell us all of the picture. It's just all as an isolated metric. So I think if this is me not saying things like heart rate variability, that they don't work, they're a great tool, but you need to paint an overall picture with them, not just relying on that, that one metric. So, you know, if you look at your watch and it says heart rate variability suggests you're overreach um, and you should deload or, or have an easy day. And you're like, but I feel great go go to the gym you know have a good session don't worry about the metric because before all that shit was invented what did people do they just used their own initiative so um i think yeah just sometimes common sense approaches can supersede metrics and sometimes the metrics are, are quite important um, and and running the two parallels is essentially what an evidence-based practices approach is and that's what we should do absolutely and, and i think something that's interesting there as well is to consider the role of personality and the, the client's personality and how they interact with that type of equipment or even just their own self-report. Uh, you kind of mentioned it there, but you know, to, to give some examples, like I have, I, I coach, I just coach online. So the vast majority of my clients are general population, but I have some people who are into some athletic endeavors, but I have one client and she's the typical kind of savage who's just going to keep on training you know like is yeah. just not going to tell is 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 less likely to be like oh you know i'm feeling fatigued and it came to it came to to this week and she won't mind me saying this but she she had done a uh, she had done a triathlon at the weekend and she'd done like an eight kilometer swim last week but she also plays like county level uh football here ga and she does weight training and just just everything and she's doing a phd in engineering like just like an all-around saddle wow. type of type of person you know um and she was she she was saying this week that uh her her wrist was at her a bit and her knee has been at her a bit and she was like you know i'm more tired than usual and i'm not sure why it is i've been sleeping you know and you know the motivation to train was maybe down a little bit just all these different factors that kind of come together and 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 she's kind of saying like oh you know so, someone made a comment that uh i'm always i'm always on the go i'm always busy and in my check in i was like you, you know this is actually <laughs> this is something you need to to be aware of that like you are someone who's probably four standard deviations above the 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 amount of exercise that people do but also the amount that, that people take on in their lives in general so for someone like that they're willing to take on so much life stress so much training stress and they're far less likely to acknowledge it because they're just like 
hey, that's normal. So for me, in that case, I, I have to be the one to kind of step in and say, hey, you know, you actually are doing a lot. You know, we, this might actually be a case where we need to, I need to be stepping in more to try and pull you back because I know you'll keep pushing forward. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, I've had clients who, you know, as soon as they feel a bit too fatigued or maybe they were more tired at work or if they're using things like activity watches or whatever, they saw that their resting heart rate was up a few beats, they'll immediately say things like, you know, oh, I, I didn't feel like I was fully recovered, so I skipped the gym today and I might skip it tomorrow as well because I, I want to be feeling 100% before my next session. So understanding, I think, like the personality differences between those types of people can also help the types of decisions you make in terms of whether you ask questions more regularly, do you check in with your clients on WhatsApp during the week or whatever, or whether you're tracking these types of metrics. Because for some clients, I actually try to get them to step away from from tracking all these variables if they're obsessed with them. And I see that it might actually be having detrimental effects potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Education is, is a large part of the overall role of a, of a personal trainer and or coach. Um, just building that coach athlete relationship and getting the buy-in and making sure that you understand the needs and the wants and the goals of the client and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it, I actually, thought of a scenario there just based off what you were telling me and again when we were interviewing some of these um, world-class coaches they were telling stories exactly like that you know you're having an easy day today and then they'll, they'll call them up the next day oh where are you oh, i'm at the gym <laughs> you're like no you're not supposed to be you're not supposed to be at the gym you're supposed to be having an easy day you should be having your feet up and there are some some people like that and there are some the opposite way where you have to almost drag them into the gym to train um and then just as a, a kind of a scenario to illustrate that that individual response to training load is um, in the late 90s, when apparently ethics did not exist in overtraining research, they created a resistance training uh, program to purposely push athletes into overtraining to then measure some of the responses, biochemical responses, performance-related responses. And it was a pretty cool, again, I don't know how they got it through ethics, but they were getting athletes to do 10 one rep max squats a day every day for two weeks. That's a lot of one rep max squats. Um, and as you can imagine, the majority of athletes got worse, but there were some that got better. I don't know how, like some kind of metahuman response, but some got better. So, you know, even when people have tried to create a battery to break people, some have improved. Yeah, some of it, it's crazy. Some, some of those types of studies are absolutely fascinating, man. Like I think I think I, we mentioned it before in, in a brief chat that we had about um, some of the muscle damage interventions that that are put in <laughs> that got into studies in yeah. the past. Like like things like doing like a set of a hundred forced eccentrics and stuff. Like oh, oh my man. god, yeah. just nasty like, stuff. Yeah, like high volume drop jumps and things like that. Now, interesting. We we tried to put together an acute fatigue, like a muscle damage study. And I wanted to create as much volume on squat as possible to make people cry and then, you know, stick needles in them and test things. So um, we put it into ethics and they just went, oh, are you crazy? Like what? This has got no chance of getting live. So, okay, right. Let's modify it a little bit. So um, let's decrease the risk of injury with the bar falling on your bag and on the leg press instead. So, all right, let's go with the leg press let's reduce the volume a little bit. And they kept going ethics. Like, no, still not ready. Still not ready. Still not ready. And I'm like, how did this guy get this squat stuff through it in the late nineties? It's, uh, it's crazy. But yeah, like the realistic risk is from my perspective, I'm looking at mechanistic stuff there, but there's minimal ecological validity. And what I mean by that is that's not how people train in the real yeah. world. There probably are some people out there. I know of a couple that do daily one rep max squats at that type of volume because that's how they train. And they are so well-trained that they need that kind of stimulus. But, you know, for someone like me, if I even try to do that, by, by day two, I'd just be in the fetal position, yeah. just crying my eyes out, asking for my mom, you know? Um, that's just not how I would want to train. So, like, from my perspective, in terms of my research, um, yes, there'll be interventions going forwards, but they have to replicate how people train in order to have that validity going forwards. And I think that's one of the issues that we've had in some of the previous research is the, they've been artificial training interventions. They've been purposely put in place to force overreaching, not let's see how people train and then see if anyone did overreach or did overtrain. Um, I think one thing that we've not answered yet, or I've not answered yet, is that you know, whether overtraining does actually exist or not. Yeah, of course it does. Of course it overtrains. Several, you know, several case studies where we've seen athletes 
that have taken years to recover, some that have never recovered and it's ruined their careers and you know, some that have taken months to recover and the reoccurrence rate is like 90% in endurance sports um, where you know, the, the constant training loads are relatively high, um, body masses tend to be a little bit lower, lean tissue tends to be a little bit lower. Whereas in strength sports, we're not seeing those numbers. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means we're not seeing it in the science. So when we've looked at some of these intervention studies, maybe we've seen one or two that have overtrained. Um, one that was clear overtraining was in CrossFit. And that was, yes, it was um, to do with the high training loads, but it was also to do with the fact that they were following low carbohydrate diets as well. And we know that you know glycogen depletion not only decreases performance, but it also slows down recovery rate. That makes complete sense. So, okay, what do we take home from that? Well, if you are in an overreach or you're training really hard, make sure you get in sufficient carbohydrates in your diet, as well as other macronutrients, obviously, but make sure that that becomes a priority. So little things that you can do to kind of avoid moving into this non-functional territory. But, you know... I, I've had arguments with people in the past about, no, you weren't over, you didn't suffer from overtraining syndrome. You were overreached. And I kind of sat myself down. I was like, I'm just being a pedantic fuck now. Like, does it matter? Yeah. The fact was they pushed too hard. How do we fix it? Not let's label it. So the term now, I think, again, coming back to the end user, the, the term overtraining syndrome, overtraining, overreaching, doesn't really mean much. What we need to take from it is that that athlete pushed too hard. How do we fix it? And how do we stop it from happening again? I think that's, that's the kind of reality and that's that pracademic perspective that I try to look at is let's take the label off and let's see how we're going to fix this and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. And, and I think it's, that's especially important. I think as you bring it down to like people like myself, like trainers who are working with mostly everyday people, like don't get me around it, training hard, like for sure. But like, we're not talking about elite athletes or anything. Basically the question for, for us is trying to figure out, okay, what level of fatigue, fatigue is acceptable for our clients? And how do we know if we're maybe pushing it too far and pushing them to the, to the point where they're actually not going to adapt and they didn't get the benefits from the training? And as we said, it's nice that you can reflect at the end of a training block and say, okay, this is how you felt. This is what we did. We have this to reflect on in future. Let's see how you get on in this training block. And then we can reflect over the course of three training blocks or whatever and say, was there improvement? Why was there improvement? Why wasn't there improvement? And I think that kind of iterative process just works really well in a kind of a standard personal training approach or, or SNC approach where if you don't have like Olympic athletes, you don't have the same pressure because like if, you've a, if you're a personal trainer, like you can just like there's no end point to when your client needs to gain 30 kilos on their squat or whatever. So yeah. you have some freedom there in, term, in terms of that flexibility. But that's fundamentally the question is, you know, at what point is fatigue pushing to the point of too much? And, and you, published, you published a study with, I think that was just this year, wasn't it? You did a, a survey on some of the symptoms of overtraining yeah. in, in strength sports. And I think, sorry, just to cut you off, but um, some of the things that came up were probably things that trainers would, would expect a lot of the time. And, and probably I, I've heard them reported a lot of the time. So what are some of the things that, that you found in your survey that, that weight trainees were, were reporting quite a bit as fatigue accumulated? Yeah, that was a really cool study. And I can say that because I was mid author. So I, I was more of an editor on the journal article as opposed to I conducted the actual research. So it's not like my own baby that I'm saying that's a beautiful baby. It's just more, uh, I got to look at some of the data that came through and I was like, this is really, really cool. So it was, it was primarily looking at people that were, uh, that participated in resistance training or were involved in sports where resistance training was part of the overall training approach. So there was everything from bodybuilding to weightlifting to throwing sports and sprinting and CrossFit was in there and things like that. Um, there was, I think, 600 or so respondents. I'm going from memory on this, to be honest. Um, the, the paper got published not long back, but we actually sent it for, for publication quite a while back. And from those 600 respondents, we got a high proportion that said that they'd suffered from some kind of unexplained dip in performance. I think maybe 79%, 70%, still relatively high number of people said, you know, dip in performance, don't know why. We stratified that into time frames. So those that suffered from what we'd class as more acute fatigue, maybe a week or two weeks, then those that were overreached, so maybe you know a month or so, 
a couple of months and then those were kind of the four months onwards which were i guess we could technically class as being overtrained there are always issues with survey data because how do i know that the person filling out the survey understood the questions and things like that um were they writing answers that they thought we would want to hear and there's all those kinds of issues but you know it was large volume exploratory survey data um so from those i think you know what i think it was 70.9 percent. someone read it and someone tell me if i'm wrong <laughs> um, but um, so from those the large proportion suffered this unexplained dip in performance for no more than four weeks so we could say okay well pretty much you were overreached at worst and I think we had something like 4% of people would have been technically classed as overtrained. So from those 600 people, only 4% would have been classed as overtrained. We then looked at what some of the um, non-training stress load was like as well. So from those uh, that said they suffered from unexplained uh, performance dips, how many of them had life stresses? And that was like 92%. It was a huge amount of people. These are not elite athletes. These are people with jobs and families and social lives and things like that. And then we looked at, okay, well, what are these life stressors? And as you can imagine, work was up there and you know, again, family commitments and things like that, because this is real life stuff that you have to manage, but it takes its toll. And I think, you know, look at some of the work that John Bartholomew did on uh, university students and some of the performance metrics, you split them into two groups. Those that appear to be very stressed about exams, those that don't appear to be stressed, give them the same workout and see what happens to strength. You know, it doesn't take a genius to work out that those that were really stressed got a little bit worse relative to those that weren't as stressed because stress is stress is stress. It takes its toll. Uh, what else did we look at? Um, we looked at some of the symptoms and we said, okay, well, do the symptoms change? Are they more progressive? And they weren't, they were all over the place. So some people were saying that they felt really, really sore um, during a phase of acute fatigue some were saying that they felt sore at overreach. Some were not sore at all. Some had little niggly knocks and, you know, aches and strains. Some didn't. Um, there was no pattern as such with the symptoms, which comes back to, and if we layer on more around this definition of, you know, overtraining, overreaching being significant decreases in performance for either, you know, weeks for overreaching or, or several months for overtraining, um, that can be with or without symptoms other than a decrease in performance so again you could as we did we collected a bunch of people and said well you know you got worse but what were the symptoms because if we understand what the symptoms are as researchers we can start to put interventions in place to to stop that from happening there's nothing of any value whatsoever some people were getting worse but had no symptoms some people had every symptom under the sun maybe maybe that comes back down to personality i'm not so sure it's not my area of, of expertise at all but there's so many different moving parts that it becomes extremely difficult to pinpoint that, that area where we go, okay, that's too much training. That's too much stress. We need to reel it back. And I think that's then where planned overreaching becomes a little bit of a risky process, unless you know your athlete, you know your own body. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was really interesting as well, because even, even when you look, when I was looking through, I was looking through that paper and I was looking at the, some of the, the bar graphs that she had. And I was like, initially I was like, oh yeah, look, general feelings of fatigue is like really consistently prevalent across all. But then I was like, hold on, 32% in those who had performance decrements for over four months. That means like 68% of people just didn't actually have mm. that, that same that same feeling of general feelings of fatigue. So, you know, it is difficult to, to tease out what's going on there, but in terms of, in terms of your own practice or what you'd think as a pracademic, um, what are some of the things that you'd look out for that are just like easy to ask about when someone, is, when you think someone might be pushing a bit too far with the fatigue? Um, there are, there are various theories out there that overreaching is just an accumulation of muscle damage and from a mechanistic perspective that makes a lot of sense so i think a really nice simple question to ask is how sore do you feel today um that doesn't mean that if the answer is i feel quite sore that we go whoa we need to stop the training yeah. session because if i am right in the middle of a block and i'm trying to accumulate a stimulus it might just be a case of suck it up just get on with it but if I am trying to take a preventative approach, and that could be either because an athlete's getting ready for competition or it's just a general population client who we don't want to hinder their everyday life. Mm -hmm. you know, We don't want them to be extremely sore. 
then I might make the decision to reduce the training load a little bit, the overall training load. So, you know, that could be one. I think just general open questions are always of value. How are you feeling generally? How stressed are you? Are you ready for this session? And just being reactive to that situation. Again, that becomes easier with a client that you've worked with possibly longer term and you understand them as a person. Um, but that dialogue is really, really important because, and I've had this chat with several people, if, if that dialogue wasn't important, then there would be no need for personal trainers. We could just all run it through an app. That, and that, that boggles my mind. If we let metrics take over, if we let the machines take over, it's like Skynet. If we let the machines take over, then all of us as personal trainers are out of the job. Fortunately, those metrics will never have the power that we do as personal trainers, which is being able to ask questions and react accordingly. Yeah, and I think that is really important because I, like that relationship building for me is like one of the most valuable things about working with people longer term because like I'll have some clients who like I know that it, when, it, when it comes to the, a certain level of fatigue or they're at a certain point in the training block, especially if we're doing, let's say, higher frequency squats or deadlifts or whatever, that you know their back will start to get a little bit sore. But because we've been there before, I know that it's okay. You know, you've got a little bit of back pain, but that's okay. You know to expect this when we've got this level of fatigue. Then we can just say, let's carry on and we'll have our deload next week. It's no problem. Let's let's just push on with training. This is normal for you. And that that that's good for me and it's good for them because they're like, hey, I don't actually have to stop training. Whereas, you know, if they were to just uh, go into some algorithm that says, uh, oh, if you have X level of pain and X level of fatigue, et cetera, stop training, um, then that's not giving them the best approach for them really. And, and yeah, I think, um, I think that's just really important is knowing what, what to expect from your clients, what's normal for them. I think that's a, a useful one as well is, you know, I've had, I had one client who signed up recently and he said he was real concerned about his back actually being quite tight because he said, look, the last time that I had, um, I hurt my back quite bad. This is what it felt like leading up to that period of time. So I'm like, okay, that's really informative because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to push you there and take that risk just because I know it's at least impacted by your attitudes and beliefs and your past experiences. So like you said, I don't think all that stuff can be cleanly wrapped up into an app if it can uh, we, we'll have it as a well, triage who app. knows i mean <laughs> yeah. eventually ai will get to that point eventually where yeah will not be necessary but um yeah maybe we can listen back to this podcast in you know <laughs> 30 40 years when we are out of the job because ai has taken over the world but um yeah that's a frightening prospect <laughs> yeah i actually did have one question that i that i wanted to, to ask before i got on that tangent and that was um when we're looking at uh, training fatigue as it accumulates and we push towards that spectrum of, of non-functional overreaching, do we know if there's a difference between, let's say, more uh, typical bodybuilding, higher volume, higher rep training and powerlifting, higher intensity training? Is, is there a difference there in terms of fatigue accumulation? Um, I think, so the, the honest first answer is I haven't looked a lot at the kind of bodybuilding participant field um, because my research interest is more specifically geared towards yeah. performance um, I have said this before uh, that I'm really interested in the kind of MRV MEV type stuff that, that Mike Israel does and I think eventually I'll go into the bodybuilding field and kind of see what happens and see if the research is any different from the kind of aesthetic athletes that lift weights relative to the performance athletes that lift weights um, the, the kind of tentative bits of information are out there or you can overreach on high intensity and or high volume training protocols, but the real risk factor is when you combine the two. So lots of high intensity and high volume at the same time, you know, throw in a little bit of glycogen depletion there and <laughs> you're steamrolling straight into non-functional overreach and probably eventually overtraining as well. So um, no, there doesn't seem to be any consistency and I don't like giving that answer of, you know, it depends, but the, the, va the variation between participants is so big that I just, I wish we could come up with some kind of conclusion. Um, cause then I would pass my PhD straight off and that'd be kind of cool, but, uh, but we're nowhere near that yet. I don't think, but yeah, I think once, once we found something that's really cool in the performance field, I think we'll move on to aesthetic sports and, my, you know, having worked with lots of bodybuilders in the past, I think that would be really cool because 
certainly the bodybuilders I've worked with just love saying, you know what, I'll come and participate in this protocol because you will not break me. Like I'm a volume based machine. There is not a protocol that exists that will push me into non-functional territory. And I'll just rub my hands. I'll be like, mate, let's just wait go. And see what I've got on my sleeve. <laughs> Forget <laughs> ethics. Let's do it. Let's do it informally. Like warehouse training. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I remember there was, there was one of Brad Schoenfeld studies a, a few years ago. It might've been, it might've been 2014, 2015 at this point, but he had one study that, that was trying to basically, it was using a kind of a volume load type of approach. So doing more sets with lower reps versus less sets with higher reps and trying to see what the differences there were and, and hypertrophy outcomes were basically the same. Um, however, the, the drop, the dropout rate and rates of, uh, adverse adverse incidents, if I recall correctly, were greater in the higher sets with lower reps um, intervention. So, so yeah, I don't think many people use like volume load as their main thing anyway. Like, I think there's there's probably drawbacks to that. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting to to see that because I think it does fit with um, some anecdotal reports where you know, if you are just doing lots of sets of lower and of higher, higher intensity work, just to try to get all the reps in, like mm-hmm. you will be pretty beat up after that, you know? Um, so, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see you. Yeah. See that you. was my, my interest was baited slightly by, I don't know, Mike Zodos did a podcast. I can't remember what the channel was. And I suppose it would be improper to talk about someone else's podcast channel on your podcast. Oh, but please, he did, please he, do. Did the, he did a really cool one based around why people might want to use an overreach for the purposes of hypertrophy. But again, it's just, I, I exist within this really minute niche at the moment. And that's all I read about. That's all I research. That's all I kind of care about. The, the kind of detriment to that is you forget little bits that exist outside of that in the periphery. And I'm kind of like, you know what? I do want to kind of come back to those hypertrophy markers and almost, I guess, in a way, experimentally validate the MRV stuff. Um, But again, that's just a little bit further down the line. I think I'd be naive to think that within the next year or two when the PhD is finished, I'll have solved all the world's problems in overreach. And I think, you know, hopefully get a PhD out of it and go, right, you know, let's crack on with a career in this and see where else we can go with it. I'm lucky enough to have um, chatted with Brad a few times actually about the overreach and overtraining stuff because as part of TRA performance, he's been a speaker a couple yeah. of times and, you know, over, over a couple of glasses of wine and some seafood, we've chatted about hypertrophy and overreaching and overtraining. And um, he's obviously you know, he's a complete expert in that field and he's got some really good ideas and kind of jotting him down and going, yeah, that'd be a cool little sideline study. So um, I definitely have a career's worth of little studies in the back pocket. We'll have to see where he goes. Yeah, and I think to be honest, I think if you do decide in a few years to transition into more hypertrophy or bodybuilding focused stuff, there's still be plenty of work to do because, like as you know, like whatever about strength sports, there's even less rigorous evidence there for hypertrophy training generally. Generally, because obviously it's probably of less interest to a lot of actual competitive athletes, you know, um, just yeah. aesthetics. <laughs> and I, as as I always say in the podcast, I'm like, you know, hypertrophy seems to be like when you look at like training, it's more of a it's not, it's not necessarily a component of the fitness itself, but more like a side effect <laughs> of the training that you do a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there will be, be plenty of questions to, to, to answer. But one of the other things I was going to say about that is that it's interesting how like a lot of the, a lot of the concepts of like periodization and overreaching, et cetera, they've almost just been translated into hypertrophy training without there actually yeah. being evidence to show that super compensation even happens in, in hypertrophy mm-hmm. training. Um, I think there has been, I think Cody Hahn might have had one study. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cody's brought some stuff out recently, but again, that's, that's just a drop in the ocean really. Yeah, exactly. A, yeah. So um, there's lots to be learned. <laughs> there is, there is. And, and again, this, I, I've fallen fortunate in that it is such an under researched area and there's just so many cool little things and a little bit like, um, I have friends that are in bands and stuff like that. And, you know, they have a little notepad and a, a lyric pops in the head and they'll scribble it down. And they're like, that's, that's a great lyric. I'm in my sad existence. I'm the same with like research design ideas. I'll just be, you know, driving along and I'll be like, shit, that's a really cool research project. Pull the car over. Cause obviously you've got to do it legally, get yeah. the pen and paper out, start <laughs> scribbling ideas down. Like that'd be really cool. And then either, you know, you, you get on your um, search database and you go, oh, someone's already done it. Yeah, that's good. Done. <laughs> or someone's already done it. Oh man, that's rubbish. Uh, I'll have to replicate the data. Or um, or you just go, right, let's see if we can push forwards and get that research project done. And 
um, little little things like with the survey paper with um, with Clem, that actually wasn't part of my PhD. It was just that the the researchers in the overreaching and overtraining sphere are so tightly knit and there's so few that sometimes it makes sense to just go, you know what, let's just kind of work together. And I've got some stuff I, I can talk about, some stuff I can't talk about at the moment, but I've got some really cool projects that are underway at the moment. Um, which um, which would be pretty mind blowing, and and I'm honoured to be part of. Um, I don't know why I'm in this position. I don't know why I appear to have some kind of expertise, but I'm just interested in knowing what it takes to break someone. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah no. I think I think if people are interested in this kind of area of research, um, I think just yeah, just keep your eyes open and and um, just kind of look out for the research coming out because it'll be coming thick and fast i think over the next year or two brilliant we will be looking forward to it but it, for just to finish on a note for for practitioner for practitioners so for, for like personal trainers listening and stuff obviously you'll have insight into this this area and we, we brought it up a few times but with things like heart rate variability resting heart rate different questionnaires and things like that that are available um like personally one of the things that i found to just be so useful in just like my tracking document that i have for clients each day is like just give me a well-being score out of 10 each day how did you feel when you woke up this morning like such a simple thing but are there other things like that that you would recommend to to trainers to potentially bring into their arsenal to start monitoring things like just recovery and fatigue or what's simple and what's practical do you think there are sometimes there are elements of gamesmanship, sportsmanship kind of stuff um, where we, we want to appear like we're being analytical and objective yeah. and science driven in the eyes of the client because it gives us some kind of gravitas and expertise. And that's cool. And if we then can use that data, that's even better. Sometimes it can be just as simple as going, I'll tell you what, after every training session, I want you to give it a rag rating, red, amber, green. How did you feel? And then pull it on a spreadsheet and just look, look for patterns. Green, 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 amber. Oh, I don't care about that. Green, green, green. And then a couple of reds and we go, right, we need to start asking some questions. So where you sit on that pendulum swing is entirely up to you. If you want to run this kind of parallel, you know, let's have the conversation with the athlete and let's look at the metrics. I think that's probably the best approach, but that's a very blanket approach uh, or that's a very blanket statement should I say some people might want to be data driven and they love numbers and they get a lot of value from it and so they're uh, their clients great do it some people haven't got the time for that it can take it can take hours sometimes to look over data but it takes a few seconds to just say tell me how you are today so you know it kind of sounds ironic in a way for a, a sport and exercise scientist to go don't use data all the time it's got value, but it, it can't replace again. I keep, it's the same thing I keep saying now, but it, it doesn't replace that discussion that you have with your clients. So just don't overcomplicate things. Brilliant. And I'm so happy to hear you say that because like if people have, have listened to the podcast for a while, like they've, they'll have heard like both Patty and I, like both of us are interested in science. Like if there's something that's useful and analytical, I want to hear about it. But like both of us are at the point where we're like, look, We've tried multiple different things over time. Over time, I, we know that it can seem more scientific to track all these variables and try to correlate them, etc. But over time, you just learn that you know it's the basic soft skills, communication skills, knowing your client, etc., that are the really important things. You know, and it's not as sexy, but I always say it to my clients. I'll I'll, I'll remind them because some people might want to uh, track lots of data and I'll say, look, see this perceived well-being score here that I've got in your tracking document. That is just as if not more valuable to me than you tracking these four other things. So let's keep on top of that first. And then we can see if we'll, we'll use the other stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's great to hear you reinforce that. <laughs> one, one thing that I would say is that I, um, I did a podcast a few months back now <clears throat> And we got, we got into the kind of mechanistic stuff around heart rate variability. And it basically was, it's a nice tool, but it's not fantastic. And then at the end of the podcast, the guy went, yeah, we're kind of sponsored by heart rate variability tool. Um, and surprise, surprise, apparently that podcast got, it got deleted by mistake. 
Hmm. Really? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, no, but we, we, we've got, a, we got, we have a whole, but we have a podcast on heart rate variability as well. And it's, it's one of those things where like you go through all the nuances. Cause I find it really interesting. I, I love cardiovascular physiology. Oh, man, it's cool. Like, yeah. So, yeah. I think it's so cool. Like, and, and the way that you measure all the different things and like just even the, the raw ECG traces are, are of interest to me, but it kind of comes down to one of those things like, all right, you've just nerded out for all this time, learning all this stuff. And then you get to the end of the podcast guess and it's like yeah so it's not really that useful um it might be good for some people but yeah <laughs> it's just yeah i think in, in endurance population yes in endurance i think yeah and i like the idea of so we're writing a chapter at the moment around some of those autonomic changes and the combination of heart rate variability and ppg um which can photoplethysmography i think yeah, <laughs> yeah where you're looking at volumetric changes in um uh, it, r- blood level at tissue level um that seems to that seems to have some um potential as a sensitive metric in endurance training but just not in strength sports because there just isn't that kind of disturbance at that level um in endurance training again we'll see some disturbances in we'll have reduced maximal heart rate we'll have either elevated or decreased resting heart rate based off whether it's adesinoid or basidoid which two different two different types of overtraining response um Elevated blood lactate, which kind of runs alongside those changes. And there's, there, there are hundreds upon hundreds of different markers where we might be able to use them in endurance training and to some degree more kind of like intermittent sports as well. But in strength training, we're just kind of banging our head because we're like, none of that seems to be happening. Um, there was one paper and it came out this week that looked at nocturnal changes in heart rate variability in strength sports after a short-term period of intensified training, which we could call overreaching. And there was there was a little bit of a change. It was significant. You know, it hit p-value thresholds, but that's one paper, so I can't make firm assumptions off that. So I could come on now and just be like, yeah, nocturnal heart rate variability changes based off intensified resistance training. We can't do that because there's not sufficient evidence yet, which is why I'm always very, very wary of making assumptions based off one single paper. But... You know, fast forward six months, 12 months, there might be more papers come out. And we go, you know what? We didn't think there were big heart rate variability changes just off strength training practices, but we think there are now. And that's cool. And that's that's the beauty of science is we get to yep. change our position. So if someone goes, you know what? You were wrong. You just go, mm, well, yeah, <laughs> I was back then. But the evidence is always evolving. Yeah, and this is why this is why I love talking to people like yourself who are like, actually in the process of doing science and, and actively being scientific thinkers because like it, it's interesting to see someone who's like you're you're in like this is your area of expertise and you're still coming around and talking on the podcast not trying to be an expert just being like yeah we don't know this we don't know this we don't know this we don't know this you know and that's the reality i think of expertise and of a lot of people who are actually scientific thinkers and i think that's a lesson for the listeners is that you know you didn't come on here and try to show off every single detail of everything you you know, but rather you're like, yeah, we actually don't know all this shit and I'm, it's amenable to change and that's science, you know? Yeah, so I, I taught personal training courses for 12 years and I think the first few years of teaching that course was my first experience of being at the front of a room as an authoritative figure um, at that point working towards a master's degree. And I, I would answer every question with complete authority. This is the answer. And there's, I'm not wrong. And now I've just become very, very comfortable in just going, I don't know. Or I think I know, but you know what? I'm not going to give you an answer because I don't want to give you the wrong answer. That for me is quite important. Um, I, I seem to be only invited on podcasts now to talk about overtraining. And that's cool with me because it requires very little research, but I know what I'm talking about. I can talk about from an authoritative standpoint. There are other areas. I mean, I'm a lecturer. I don't just get to, you know, sit in an office all year and then, oh, Lee's up for his overtraining lecture. I get wheeled out and talk for an hour and I'm back in my office for another year. You know, I do other things, but I like talking about this. And um, again, you know, David Nolan, we're, we're good friends and we chat regularly and he said, would you rather become an expert in that niche field or be known as a kind of more of a generalist? And I'm like, you know what, mate? I don't think I'll ever get bored of the overtraining research because there's so much out there. I am more than happy to be known as the kind of the overtraining guy as time goes on. You know, it doesn't sound as cool as the glute guy or the hypertrophy guy, but I'm having it, you know? So that's, I'm going to buy the domain. I'm going to commit. 
over <laughs> overtrainingguy.com. I don't know if it exists, but we'll have to see. <laughs> you were the muscle mechanic. <laughs> oh man. That was an in joke. That was an in joke. It was based off Titan. Um, and it was, uh, it was an in joke about the uh, end to A and PVK elements of Titan. And the model yes. was called the muscle mechanics model. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, that's my business name now. And then people were like, I think it means something in the military. And others were like, oh, that guy, Eugene Teal, who um, I'm not a fan of, but we'll leave that there. And I was like, I don't want anything to do with this domain. So if anyone wants to buy a website, the muscle <laughs> mechanic, I think it's UK. I can't even remember. I've not been on it yeah. for ages now. That's available to buy. In fact, I will pay you to take it off me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's actually funny because I initially, I initially came out across your website by accident because um I was I was writing something about squatting and I was writing about um Lombard's paradox and I was oh, like yeah. I was like it's I was like it's so weird that no one ever it's no one talks about this and I think there was two articles who had mentioned Lombard's paradox and one was Greg Knuckles and the other was the Muscle Mechanic <laughs> so I was like who's this guy and I was like oh yeah that's Lee Bell he I know him through David Nolan or whatever. so yeah just just read Greg. Just read yeah. Greg's now, it's better than mine. But yeah, little esoteric things like, what is Lombard's, Lombard's Paradox? Oh, I'm going to write about that. Yeah. And like probably gets about four people, you know, every six months click on it. It's probably all you, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I, yeah, I'm going to ditch that website. And um, I, I I do write a lot of articles. I've probably published online maybe three 3,000 articles or so. I worked as a writer for a couple of years. Um selling articles to different websites which was really cool i really enjoyed it i learned a lot about it just being able to sit behind a computer and just write stuff what's on my mind um and i, I recently wrote one for the conversation which is a really cool website actually it got picked up by yahoo news and i've no idea why but they figured out that i own a domain called leebell.co.uk and they backlinked the article to that website and i had this massive panic moment i was like shit like, I, I don't even know what's on that website. And it was just a picture of me. So, like, no value to it whatsoever. So, I was like, right, I need to get some content migrated over to that website. So, um, yeah, if you're listening, make sure you click on that website. Don't click on the muscle mechanic one. Okay, leebell.co.uk. But, yeah, no, that is interesting, actually, because you did I, – I can't was – it, was, it, was it David's podcast or was it someone else's podcast? You had, you had a podcast on – your kind of life as a, a fitness writer as well did you or did you yeah, write about that right. somewhere yeah i think it i think it was on david yeah yeah because i remember listening to you talk about that and i was like god i didn't even i didn't even know this i didn't know you did you did that much writing you've written for like t nation and all those types of websites and everything yeah yeah t nation muscle and strength uh danny's website as well sigma yeah uh, elite fts um, just a mercenary, basically. I'd either contact a website and say, can I write for you? Here's my kind of writing history. And they go, yeah. Um, some you get paid for, some you do for free, but it's still a value because you'll get them traffic and links to your website. And then others where I'll just be like, you know what, things like Lombard's Paradox, I'm going to write it. And then if anyone wants to buy that article, they can do. And if they don't, it goes on my website. Um, so some stuff I've got written, I mean, my name seems to be all over the place, but um, there, there's a footballer, I don't know if he's an ex-footballer now. He used to play for Crew. He seems to rank above me, which I'm annoyed about. There's a guy who writes for Forbes, and he does, like, fitness technology stuff. So a couple of people have got me and him mixed up. Um, and then there's various other bits on there. But, um, but yeah, and then some of it's just ghostwritten. So some, some websites get in touch, and they go, we want you to write some articles for us, but we won't put your name on them. And as long as it's not someone else putting their name on my articles, I don't mind. If it's just content yeah. on a website, if it educates people and it helps them, I'd rather me do it than me say no. And then they go and ask someone else who, you know, writes some bullshit for them. Um, so ghostwriting is actually, from a monetary perspective, a pretty decent job, if I'm being honest. But nice. um, after a couple of years, I got a little bit bored of it and I kind of wanted to do something different um, rather than just, you know, sitting all day at a computer in my Avengers pajamas. <laughs> writing about you know hamstring and quad, quad core contractions and things like that <laughs> <laughs> so with all that fitness nerdy stuff aside to close us out lee what are some things that you're you're interested in outside of the whole strength and fitness thing any any things you like to read or do as hobbies or what's what's your yeah. thing you know at this moment in time not a great deal because i'm just right in the thick of preparing for the next academic year 
um, got a couple of book chapters I'm working on, a couple of studies that I'm trying to write up, so not a great deal. Um, I'm actually absolutely obsessed with collecting sneakers, trainers. That's, yeah. that's my big passion. Vinyl records as well. Absolutely love the old school dub reggae stuff. So I collect some of that stuff. Um, just a typical nerd, I think, you know, collect Lego and things like that. And um, what else? I mean, in terms of my reading stuff, I like to read a lot of texts that get me thinking about what my own purpose in life is. So a lot of kind of like the the kind of metaphysics stuff. I don't understand any of it, but I like to read that kind of critical analysis me stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think I love I love things that help me as an academic, but aren't to do with sport and exercise science. So I like to listen to um, podcasts podcasts around evidence based practice that are to do with things like literature and um, what else language and things like that that are not necessarily to do with the medical sphere but all of a sudden i'd be like you know what that was worth listening to because i've got this little nugget of information that actually to think about it helps me with my practice here um so lots of different things i'm coming across like a complete nerd now in all honesty i think that's I'm completely cool. okay <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah i do uh, i think my instagram is either pictures of books i'm reading or pictures of trainers that i bought <laughs> Yeah, but the, like the books is one thing, but man, t- saving up trainers, collecting trainers is an expensive jo- an expensive hobby, isn't it? It can be. I do wear them. I, I have some yeah. friends who are hardcore. Like they put them in like, you know, clear perspex boxes and they don't wear them and they just resell them or they'll just collect them and look at them. I don't know. I don't know if they take them out of the box and stroke them or what. I'm not too sure, but um, I, just like, I just like buying trainers because they're just cool. And there are worse hobbies to be involved in, I think. For sure. You could be doing a lot worse, brother. <laughs> That's what I told myself. <laughs> yeah. So with all that said, to close us out, what's, um, where can people find your work? We've already talked about your multiple domain names, but where would yeah. you refer <laughs> Also, so, <laughs> go on, man, sorry. I was just going to say also with the, with the TRA performance education, I presume COVID has affected your schedule, but do you have anything coming up or anything that you'd like to mention? Yeah, so traperformanceeducation.com. So Paul and I, we're running a face-to-face seminar business. So like we've already said, we invite people like Brad Schoenfeld over and they will do talks. Um, They tend to be very practitioner-oriented talks. So it's not just talking about mechanistic stuff, but how do we apply this in practice? So the kind of made audiences, personal trainers and coaches. Uh, Obviously, like you said, COVID's put a halt on that for the moment. We have got three speakers in line for next year but we're not going to release them yet because we kind of don't know what the situation is yeah. going to be so we have got some online stuff at the moment so paul and i uh, we've just started our first cohort of a course which is um it's called the k series course so essentially we we reverse engineer education so it's not just here's a load of mechanistic lectures now here's how we apply it we give the students a case study and then in order to plan an intervention and a program for that case study, we then track back through some of the mechanistic data. I tend to find that when I do that in my academic setting, it works quite well. Um, so we have another cohort starting and we'll be recruiting for it starting January. Um, so cheers for the opportunity to put a nice little plug in on that. No problem. Um, Paul, Paul, Paul is, is, um, is a phenomenally intelligent guy, really, really good from a nutrition and biomechanics perspective, uh, works with some real good top, um, elite level athletes um, but that's just a kind of a little hobby business for us it's not the idea is not to make as much money as possible it's just to make a bit of money to reinvest and reinvest and reinvest so we can keep getting speakers over um, so we, we don't we only take on a small number of people for the the k series course uh, other than that obviously you know leebell.co.uk um, if you type my name in research gate you'll get some of my research papers um, if there's a research paper you're after and you can't get hold of it, you just you know send me a message on there and I'll I'll send it straight through to you. Fighting the power, making sure that the journals um, <laughs> the journals don't get all the uh, the merit for for the author's work. Um, I don't know where else you can get me. Instagram at Lee Bell. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to look at pictures of books and sneakers, you can look at me on Instagram. But I don't write content. This is the other thing. Yeah. I don't write content on Instagram because there's nothing I can really write about that's of any value that you can't get from someone else. Yeah. So rather than just adding more about, you know, calories in, calories out or things like that, which I think we, you can find that anywhere. 
is I'd rather not be driven by my ego and shit post people. Um, so I only really tend to share stuff if, if it's a value um, around the overreaching, overtraining stuff or, um, or if I buy a new pair of shoes. So, um, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. I, I, I don't think there's much value on that, if I'm being honest. That's all good. Well, they'll find you somewhere and hopefully some people might consider the, the case series course as well. So that brings us to a finish. And obviously, guys, if you're interested in triage and our work, you know where to find us as always. All the links below to the Coach's Corner, coaching spaces, etc., cetera, um, can be found below. And other than that, we will see you guys in the next episode. And thank you very much, Lee, for joining us this week. Pleasure, mate. I'm honored. Thanks.